Five. Lord, thank God you for tonight. We separated just, uh, the holy man, place from the most so old. much for all that you have taught us, all that you've revealed to us. Out of this amazing book, Lord, the uh, the plan, Lord, that you have so clearly laid out in your word about about who you are, your kingdom. And Lord, thank you so much for revealing to us where it is that we fit in. And Lord, as we come together tonight, as this amazing study comes to a, a close and end here in the next couple of weeks or the next few weeks, Lord, I'm just, uh, I'm just again thankful, just in awe of you, of your goodness, your grace, your love, your mercy um, that you continue to show towards us. And uh, Lord, as we, um, as we consider this part of our study tonight, which is, um, Lord, eternity, all that you, you've been revealing to us and preparing us for, I pray, Lord, that your spirit just reveal to us and, and, uh, and show us, Lord, uh, its beauty, its depth, its purpose as, um, as we bring this, this time together to a close, this study to a close. Thank you, Lord, for, um, man, just your goodness. Again, I pray for you, uh, for each and every one of us tonight that your spirit just, uh, just teach us, guide us, lead us into all truth, Lord. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Uh, amen, Lord. Amen. So how is everybody doing? Good, I hope. Warmed up a little bit from, I think, last week, right? So uh, good, uh, good to see everyone. So um, we are there, folks. Tonight we're beginning um, uh, the last part of our study. Chapter 21 brings <clears throat> the entire book from an event standpoint to a conclusion. And then chapter 22, which is something that we'll consider in a couple weeks, um, we, is pretty much uh, the Spirit of God tying the entire book together for us. Uh, but uh, chapter 21 is unique in the sense that it's going to reveal to us um, this part of our timeline. Um, and I'm not sure why this isn't working. Hold on a sec. Maybe? You know what? I haven't charged it in a while, but you may be right. It worked earlier. How does it charge? Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some things manually here for tonight a little bit till we get this thing. Yeah, there it is. Does this plug into the computer? Yeah, we'll do it later. I won't worry about it. But anyway, sorry about that, folks. Um, real quick. Um, that's not even working. You know what I think it is? I think it's locked up. It is locked up. There it goes. Okay. Let me try this now. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. It was locked up is all for some reason. So I think we're all familiar with this chart, right? So here's where we're, here's where we're hanging out tonight. We are in uh, this eternity future phase of our study. And, um, Again, as I've mentioned to you, and you're going to see some things tonight that I think will really kind of um, reveal to us the bigger, broader picture and why this timeline even exists. This is some of the things that I want us to consider and, uh, and look at tonight. Um, last week, if you remember, we were, we were bringing things to a close from a time standpoint, right? We know from this timeline that time has been a major a major element in God's bringing forth redemption and restoration to um, to a situation that played out out here in what we're calling eternity past. Uh, we're going to briefly touch on that a little bit because what I want us to consider that this timeline is nothing more, and I think we've talked about it or mentioned it briefly, is nothing more than God going full circle. This thing started in Genesis 1.1. Everything was perfect. And God brings us back to perfection in Revelation 21.1. And uh, those are some of the things that we're going to be looking at and considering tonight. If you look at your little booklet on the principles of Bible study, 
You're going to see uh, principles 7 and 8. The words of the Bible are the key to understanding the Bible. There's some words that we're going to kind of uh, unpack this evening that will shed light on this very truth right here and how this whole thing plays out. Because what we're going to see tonight and what we're going to observe is God doing some radical crazy things um, in his creation as he brings to a closure this whole timeline thing. In other words, God's done, man. Um, and that is uh, that is the beauty of, um, of the whole story and how it is that he included us and how he continues to include us. You've heard me say in the past, and it's part of a how to study the Bible series, but there's three plans that you find in scripture. God has a plan for the universe. We're going to talk about that extensively tonight. We're going to talk about how he restructures everything and how he's going to restructure things and, and, and make, make his creation and his universe like it was in Genesis 1.1. We're also going to look at God's plan for this planet, this earth. This is a very unique place um, outside of if you look at that, if you look at the night sky, there's only two planets that are mentioned in scripture, the planet Earth and the planet Jupiter. So Earth plays a significant part, shows up all over scripture. Why? Because he used it or he's using it to bring about this timeline, this plan, this redemptive purpose that he created. You can, again, you've heard me say it a number of times. You can't go one verse in the Bible. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So earth shows up immediately in God's ultimate plan. And then the third part of God's overall strategy and, and, and the third major part of his planning includes us, includes mankind, includes people. And look at your principle number three, or is it principle number two, uh, which is the principle of peoples. Uh, there's three types of people in this whole structure that God has laid out, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. Uh, three and only three. And uh, all you have to do is look at how, um, how effective and how strategic Satan is being and has been historically in getting people to fight into war we, with each other, especially in this day and age, how he's been very effective in using race uh, to destroy that, although it's very sacred to God. So this is where we're at. So we're going to spend some time tonight and show you how this whole thing kind of comes together. If we were to take these seven blue little humps that we call the dispensations, they would show up kind of something like this. And it's God doing nothing more than bringing his plan full circle. Five, six, seven, you know what I mean. So um, go ahead and take your Bibles. I want to share you a couple verses, a couple thoughts, um, some really interesting things. But look with me in verse number five. I'll tell you what, let's read the uh, eight verses that we're going to look. We're going to take a couple weeks to cover chapter 21. Tonight we're going to look at the first eight verses and we're titling our study tonight, All Things New, because of this verse that we're going to look at here in a minute in verse five. And then next week, we're going to just spend the entire evening looking at this whole idea of New Jerusalem, its purpose. Why is God doing these? Because part of the whole all things new uh, part of our study tonight, if you look at the first two verses of our text, um, it says this in the Bible. Um, and I saw a new heaven. This is John now, right? He's being revealed all that this that is playing out. He says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Uh, we're going to talk about that sea and what it is and where it is. It's really fascinating and interesting part of our study tonight. And then it says here in verse number two, and I, I, I John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Um, we're going to just barely touch on the whole new Jerusalem thing tonight. But we're going to really spend some time next week and unpacking its depth and its beauty because from verses 9 to 27, the remaining part of the chapter, the, whole ch the last part of this chapter is dedicated to God revealing to us what this whole new Jerusalem thing is about. So there's, through all, there's three all things that are new. A new heaven, a new earth, and a new 
Jerusalem. It says in verse uh, number two again, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is a really fascinating verse talking about God going full circle. I'm going to share with you how some of these principles, some of these truths found in verse, verse three are also found in of all places in the book of Exodus. As it relates to this whole tabernacle thing and what is the tabernacle and what was the purpose for the tabernacle and all those profound truths that we find in scripture. Verse four, and God shall wipe away all, our, all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Isn't that an awesome thing? That God's going to bring us to a whole other level spiritually and emotionally. A lot of people in this room, a lot of people in, in life generally, and we've been talking about this on Sunday mornings as we're looking at how it is that God grows our faith, how it is that trials and tribulations are a part of life to transform us, to make us more Christ-like. There's a day coming, folks, where it's all going to go away. We'll be at ultimate peace. And we'll be in a place that um, I think we all desire to be. And uh, we're going to close Bible study tonight with a really cool song that I heard way back by Jeremy Camp titled, There Will Be a Day, right? This is the day that the song speaks about. And that day's coming someday, praise God. How do we know it's coming? Look at verse five. This is a fascinating verse. It says this, And he that sat upon the throne said, speaking of Christ, behold, I make all things new. Isn't that cool? What's the implication? That there's some old stuff happening in God's plan and God's creation and he's making everything new. And he said unto me, write for these words are true and faithful. Right smack in the middle of this text about all things being new. God says, Man, church, you better know that what I'm sharing with you is real. That heaven is real. That is eternity is real. And we have all kinds of things. And we had some discussions in the last couple of weeks at Bible study about the, this, these different approaches to, to biblical interpretation. You have one extreme that looks at all this stuff allegorically that, hey, man, these are really cool stories, really nice principles to make us all feel better. And then there's the literal interpretation, the interpretation that says, man, heaven is a real place. What we talked about last week about the final judgment and hell and the lake of fire, all those things are real. All these places are real. All these events are real. And right here in the text, Jesus tells John, write these things, make it known for these words are true and what? And faithful. What's the implication there about faithful, you think? That they're going to happen. That he's going to come through on exactly what he has been laying out. Especially as it relates to this new thing. So when Jesus is meeting up with this religious guy in, um, in Jerusalem, Nicodemus, and he meets him for the first time. We're all familiar with the story, right? This Pharisee comes to him by night because of his role, his responsibility in the, in the Jewish faith and the Jewish religion. And he begins to ask Jesus some interesting, key, some interesting issues or questions about himself, about his kingdom. He goes, I know that there's something unique about you because of your miracles, because of what you're able to do. And it's in there where they start talking about this whole notion or idea about a new birth, about a spiritual birth and what that means. It's in that, in that passage where Jesus uses the words, unless a man is born again, he will not enter into the kingdom of God. Remember that story with Nicodemus? And it's in that same story where you find the most popular verse that's ever been written, John 3, 16. Where in Jesus' dialogue with this religious guy, he says to him, don't ever forget, Nicodemus, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Where's the perish part? Everything that we talked about last week. This period right here 
should not perish, but have what? But have everlasting life. That's the promise. Those are Jesus' words. If you go through and read the rest of the chapter about three more times, he talks about this, this whole idea, it's not even an idea, about the reality of an eternal life. So what we're looking at beginning tonight is exactly what's going to be happening, how things are going to be structured, how things are going to be laid out as brought God brings about redemption finally. <laughs> um, for us, that seems like a really long time, doesn't it? Right, when we think about, hey, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, or if you look at that entire timeline, we're looking at seven thousand years, if you include the millennium, seven thousand years of history in God as it relates to eternity. If imagine those two parentheses, right? That one there and this one here coming together, eternity. This is nothing more than a blip in radar. 7,000 years is nothing to God each from an eternal perspective. And again, don't lose sight of that. Don't lose that perspective. So, in our text tonight, in our passage tonight, we're going to um, see how it is that God lays this whole thing out. Take your Bibles real quick and turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to share with you a passage, Steve. Yeah, let's finish the verses. Good point. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Look at verse 6. We're at, we were actually going to look at these verses in our study tonight, but look at verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. Isn't that cool? In other words, God is just doing this at this point, man. It is done, he says. Um, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. Freely. Anybody remember that word freely? Elsewhere in the Bible? Interesting. Isn't that cool? How God's gone full circle? Anybody remember where else that word freely showed up in Scripture? Exactly. Genesis chapter 2, man, when he offered Adam and Eve everything. Just eat freely, man. It's all yours. Here's the tree of life. Eat of this tree and you will live, what? Forever. That was God's plan. That was God's intent from the very, very beginning that they do that. Verse number uh, seven. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be, I love this, and he shall be my son. There's that relationship um, factor again, that truth that just permeates the entire scripture, the entire Bible. Where's Marie? There she is. Wasn't her testimony awesome on Sunday? Doesn't that was so awesome to hear to and, and, and this is something that we drive home in our church as we're discipling people as we is as, as we invest in them. The one profound and significant truth that we drive home is this whole idea of family, this whole idea of relationship that you are now God's child. And there's nothing more sweet and or more precious than that, huh? And we were talking even on Sunday as we were talking about the Red Sea and I shared with you as we were bringing that sermon to a conclusion, to a close, how they went into the water servants and they come out on the other side sons. This is God's plan and his desire for us. He's all about relationship. He desires nothing more than be personal, intimate relationship and we get to be called sons. Look at verse eight. But the fearful... And unbelieving, and I'm not sure exactly why I pondered this verse for a couple days. Why did the Spirit of God throw this verse right smack in this incredible, powerful passage about eternity? So that we never forget, perhaps, but look at this. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And um, um, yeah, right smack, a little reminder of everything that we talked about last week. So um, take your Bibles now and turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15 because I want to share with you an interesting, an interesting thought. Um, principle number one of Bible study, context 
I don't know what you know about this, in, in this most amazing chapter in our Bible. But 1 Corinthians 15 is known as the resurrection chapter. Um, one of the most enlightening things, one of the most profound things um, that I came to absolutely embrace and really, really, um, um, I don't know, take to heart perhaps of all the Bible truths and theologies and doctrines that you find in Scripture is this whole idea about the resurrection. Because when we talk about eternal life, when we talk about eternity, Eternity could have no, couldn't have and would have never played out had it not been for the resurrection. We know that Jesus couldn't have resurrected without him even dying on the cross first, being dead, right? Rising again on the third day. So Paul really drives this home in a little, little Dave Nebel story. But when I first, David, when I first met David Nebel, he was giving me kind of a little tour of the church. And I'll never forget when he took us into the main sanctuary and i noticed and i saw a cross behind the platform where the preacher stands back in the day that i the guy's name was truman dollar when he anyway back behind the platform kind of like we have was a cross and the first thing that i noticed was that there was no jesus on the cross and i said what's up with this church where there's no jesus on the cross and he said something really, really profound that has stuck to me through this day. You know what his reply was? Because he ain't there. He ain't there. He's not there. Why? Because of the resurrection. And man, that forever stuck with me. And there are, the resurrection is what brings about life, eternal life. This whole eternity thing, everything that we're talking about tonight is completely based on the resurrection. And the resurrection chapter in your Bible is 1 Corinthians 15. That whole book, that, and there's, there's 57 verses. You know what else you find in this chapter? The mystery of the what? The rapture of the church. Isn't that cool? That the very rapture of the church mystery is found in this chapter? You know what else is found in this chapter? So this is Sylvia's favorite first four or five verses what is it sylvia the gospel. the gospel the good news the good news that every lost man woman and child needs to hear is the gospel message that's laid out in first corinthians 15 you know what that is the death burial and what resurrection and paul goes in this chapter and he talks about the importance and the significance of that message that that needs to be our message and, and you know what you want to mark a false teacher or a false, false religion, see if you could get them to define the gospel. Because if the definition of the gospel is not what you read in these first four or five verses, mark them, man. Because you hear that word gospel a lot being thrown around, right? Even loosely. Question it, doubt it. Just be a skeptic about how they use the word. Because if it's not defined based on how Paul defined it here in the text, look at first, are you guys, ever, everybody there? Look at how he lays it out. First Corinthians chapter 15, he says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. What's, what's the gospel mean? Or what does the word gospel mean? It means good news. What's the good news? In the church age, which I have received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then it talks about how even after His resurrection, there were witnesses to prove that He had resurrected. He goes on and says some really cool and profound things about the resurrection. Where it says, you know what, if you don't believe in the resurrection, or if the gospel's not really, then your religion, he says, your religion or your faith is what? It's vain. It's empty. You're doing religion for the sake of religion. It's all about the resurrection he drives home. And then go down to verse number 20, because this is where I wanted to camp out a little bit. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. But who was the man that brought about death? Adam. 
fact, you're going to see that in the text. Who is the man that brought about resurrection? Christ. Christ. Look at how the Bible will answer the very questions that we tend to ask. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made what? Alive. You know what that alive is a reference to? Eternity. Everything that we're talking about tonight. Verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end. Isn't it interesting that Paul is referring to this timeline? He's going to come, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to what? To God. Even the Father, when he, he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. When is Jesus going to be ruling? When is he going to be sitting on the throne? Millennium. We were looking at the last couple of weeks, right? Guess what he's going to do in eternity? He's giving it back to the Father. You know what he's saying? I'm done. We just read it in verse number six or seven, right? He's done. For he must reign, it says in verse 25, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. When, when is that getting done? Like a fire, the stuff that we read last week. When he hath put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be destroyed, I love this, is what? is death. No more death, man. No more pain. No more suffering. We are now living in eternity. What an amazing gift. What an amazing truth that is. That said, that comes about why? The resurrection. The resurrection. The power of that Sunday morning, man, when Jesus came out of the grave to give to you and to me that gift of eternal life. For God so loved us that he gave his son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was all part of the plan. That was all part of the design. So here's our outline for tonight. This is some of the things that we're going to look at. Again, here's our, our drilling down from that timeline, right? Backing up a little bit by way of just kind of review. This is all book of Revelation stuff right here. Um, the kingdom stuff is chapter 20, which is what we looked at last week. Here's where we're at tonight. New heaven and new earth verses 21, one through eight, one through nine, if you will. Next week, new Jerusalem and then the fullness of time. So this is where we're camping out. That is where we're at. So here's what we're breaking down tonight. We're going to look at all things new. We're going to look at a new structure. God puts in place a new system. And then we're going to share with you the, this whole idea of God's new setting. Look at verse number one with me again. And I saw a new heaven, this structure thing. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. The implication in this verse is obviously revealing to us that God is changing things up structurally. Again, don't lose sight of verse 5, man. This is not an allegorical thought. This is not some dream or something that's going to happen in the ether somewhere. These are literal physical changes that God's going to make to his entire creation. To everything that we know and everything that we see. And as I mentioned on this whiteboard, all he's doing in verse number one is he's taking us back to how things were in Genesis 1.1. So go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me there first and foremost. We're going to kind of look at some things and I think some of you have heard this a few times, but I'm going to take you to another place in Scripture, uh, to a very unique place in the Scriptures that really reveals to us some of the details that went on in Genesis chapter number one, the entire chapter as he was restructuring, as God was putting in place a structure to bring forth this timeline. 
this timeline couldn't have played out and wouldn't have happened had God not done what he needed to do to put the structure in place that needed to be there in order for us to get to these verses that we're looking at tonight in Revelation 21. When we start talking about the tabernacle or the tabernacle of God is now with you, what is the implication there? What is God trying to teach us and to reveal us, to reveal to us about this tabernacle thing? How is it that God is now the tabernacle? What was the tabernacle? What is the significance of the tabernacle? And what was its purpose? All those things is what God needs to reveal to us. And that can only happen as we go through and understand how he restructured things in the book of Genesis chapter 1. So everybody there? A couple of thoughts. Look at, how the look at how the chapter begins. Everybody hold Genesis 1-1 in your left hand and then go back to Revelation 21-1 in your right hand because you're going to see some unique words here talking about the importance of the words of the Bible, right? How does the Bible begin? In the beginning. So it begs the question, when's the beginning? The beginning of time? The beginning of the timeline? Anybody have any thoughts? Any notions? Any ideas? When do you suppose the beginning was? The Big Bang. The Big Bang. It's true. You know where the beginning was? Seriously? It was out here somewhere. Because if you, if you look closely at chapter number one, time as we know it doesn't happen till verse number 14. Till the fourth day of creation. There is no time. I'll show you that in a minute. So when's the beginning? It's out here somewhere. In eternity what? Past. And God is putting forth and putting together this incredible plan. But look at the interesting thing about verse, these two first couple verses in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth, he says. Mark this word, heaven, because it's significant. Because... A lot of the newer translations, in fact, every new translation pluralizes this word where this translation is the only one that uses the singular form. You know what is playing out? A significant truth. Everything that we're talking about tonight about God's, God's structure and his plan comes down to him going full circle. The implication in Genesis 1-1 is what? There's only one heaven. But look at verse 2, which is an interesting thought. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. We'll talk about the deep and what that is or where it is and where it shows up in the book of Revelation because it's all over the book of Revelation. But here's an interesting thought or here's an interesting notion. Would God create if we're here in eternity past before Lucifer's fall? Would God create something darkness? Would he create dark? Why? Somebody turn to 1 John chapter number 1. I want you to see something. I want you to connect dots here. Look how the Bible interprets itself. Go all the way to 1 John chapter 1. Way over by the book of Revelation. Listen closely to these words. Verse number one. That which was from the what? From the beginning. Interesting, huh? So what's the context? The beginning. Over here somewhere. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. He's making a reference to Jesus and Jesus' eternal nature. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest unto us. You know what? Jesus has always been eternal. He was living out here, but he was made manifest to John during the life of Christ in the gospel stories. Watch this, verse number three. 
that which we have seen and heard declare we declare unto you that ye may also may have fellowship with us and our truly fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is what in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth so how is it that you have in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2, darkness? A little contradiction going on, maybe? You know what happened? Something happened between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. And if you guys want a couple chapters to go and study on your own, go check out Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Ezekiel 28. So keep in mind, Genesis 1, 1, God is light, everything's perfect, everything's playing out, and God places this unique location on planet Earth before Lucifer, Lucifer, Lucifer's fall called Eden, the Garden of God. Not Garden of Eden. Eden, the Garden of God, was how God termed it. And guess what was happening on planet Earth in Ezekiel 28? praise and worship by the most beautiful creature that God had ever made Lucifer and everything was going man beautifully until the Bible said iniquity was found in his heart and then he leads a rebellion when did the rebellion happen in eternity past so in Genesis, between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, guess what played out? This incredible cosmic battle. And God says, all right, we're going to restructure this thing. We're going to redo some things so that we could bring redemption so that this timeline could be implemented and bring a redemption and restoration so that we can get back to eternity and to how things were before the fall. Now everybody take your Bibles again to Revelation chapter 21. One. Everybody there? I'll tell you what. Go back to your left hand before we go to 21. One. So you go through all of chapter number one. In fact, let's kind of keep reading there. Everybody in Genesis 1 still? Okay, let's keep the both hands going. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. But look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Is that the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic, and Mediterranean maybe? We'll see in a minute. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said the light that it was, God saw that the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. Look at verse number six. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. In other words, I want some space between this water stuff, wherever it might be, wherever it is, over maybe near Japan, Pacific Ocean perhaps. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let... It divide the waters from the waters and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. And God called the firmament, what did he call the firmament? Heaven. Interesting, huh? That he divides water from water and all of a sudden there's space between this water and he calls that Heaven. You want to hear something interesting, folks? Well, keep reading. Watch this. Verse, verse number seven. And God made the firmament and divided the water. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. You want to hear something interesting? He doesn't start dealing with earth stuff till verse nine. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together under one place and let the dry land appear. He wasn't even dealing with planet Earth in the first eight verses. You know what he was doing? He was restructuring what we call outer space, what we call the cosmos. 
You want an interesting truth, an interesting fact? We're gonna we're gonna lay, we're gonna lay it out here in the book of Revelation in a minute. There's water up there. That's what the Bible refers to as the deep. Now you'll see in a minute the purpose for that water. Why is it there? What is it that God's going to do? So again, you see God doing all this and laying all this stuff out. What? To prepare his creation for mankind to show up. This guy named Adam. His wife Eve. Eve where he says to them, all right, man, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply and I want you to replenish, he says. What does the word replenish mean? To put something back. Something back that was here back in eternity past. That's why he said replenish. Put it back. That's going to be your mission and your goal. And then Adam shows up in the book of Genesis chapter 2 and after God breathes life into him and in verse, I believe it's verse number 8 or 9 or no, I think it's verse number 15, God says to him, you know what, Adam, I need you to do two things. I need you to dress this place and I need you to keep it. Be a steward of it, take care of it and protect it. He tells him to protect it before the devil or before the serpent ever shows up. God knew that he would show up right there in number, dispensation number one, the dispensation called innocence. And the rest is history. And we're here today because of the fall. And God bringing restoration and redemption. This is why you see in that little that little red subtitle, God's plan for the ages. And in order for this plan to happen, he had to restructure things. And I mean, he could have done it any way he wanted, but he did restructure things. And in part of his plan and part of his purpose, he made things look in a very unique way. Now to flip all the way to chapter 21 now. And look how the story closes. Before we, <laughs> before we go to 21, let me show you one other thing in chapter number two of Genesis. Watch this. So this is after the six days of creation. All these things, all this restructuring plays out. And then God says this to Adam. Look at verse 2. Or, or this gets written down in scripture. Look at verse number 1. Thus the heavens. Did you catch that? The heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and, and made. Now you're going into this whole idea of not just a single heaven, Genesis 1-1, but now you're dealing with multiple heavens. Everybody tracking? Everybody with me? Now go back to Revelation 21. This is a for sure one. And look how the story ends. Look how he brings this whole thing into a into conclusion. And I saw a new what? Are you getting the picture? And a what? And a new earth. Guess what? We're back to what? What are we back to based on what's the implication? What what's the implication? You're back to one heaven. You are back to one heaven. Wait till I show you something really cool in chapter number 22. And the reason why. And what it is that God begins to do. And how this whole thing begins to play out. So he restructures everything. He does everything. And he goes completely full circle. And look at the last thought in verse number one. 
And this is a profound truth that is going to reveal so much to us about this whole thing. And the first earth were passed away. And then there was what? No more. How does the verse close? There was no more sea. Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Mediterranean Sea. What sea is he referring to is the issue. Are you getting the picture? He's done with the sea. Now begs the question, what's the sea? What, where's the sea that he's referring to? What is, he, what is it that he's talking about? Do you guys remember this from our study way back here? Who knows what month when we were looking at Revelation chapter number four and the rapture of the church? Remember that part of our study? Remember this event here, the judgment seat of Christ? In Revelation chapter 4. Go ahead and turn to Revelation 4. I'll show you something interesting. I want you to see what John sees. Because in Revelation chapter 21, he doesn't see that sea anymore. It's not there. What is this sea that he's referring to? Look at Revelation chapter 4. Look at verse number, um, number 4. And after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me said, come up hither and I will show you the things. Revelation 4, 1. Come up hither and I will show you the, the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Where is he? In heaven. And he that sat on it to look upon was his japper, his starting stone. And you're getting a picture of Jesus here, the, 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 the throne. You see the four beasts in verse number four. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven images of fire and burning before the throne, which were of the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a what? A sea of glass. Like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. You know what he's seeing? That same sea that we just read about in Revelation chapter 21 that he's done away with. You know what that sea is a picture of? This veil that separates the second heaven from the third heaven. Here's a little depiction of what is playing out of what we're seeing. Just to kind of give you, speaking of God's structure. In your Bible, and you'll see it in the 148th Psalm, there's three heavens in the Bible. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when, when the Apostle Paul almost died at, uh, at Lystra when he was stoned? And he says, I, whether out of the body and in the body, I cannot tell, but all I know is that I was talking to Jesus where? In the, in the third heaven. Remember, he makes reference to the third heaven. Well, those heavens that you read about in Revelation chapter two, after God finished restructuring, I mean, these are the three heavens. The first heaven is our atmosphere. This is this dome, if you will, that protects this planet from the sun, from meteors from all the stuff that is out there all the space junk and everything else that is known as the first heaven the second heaven we know as outer space or the cosmos anybody know what the term cosmo means or the definition of the word cosmo what does it mean it means order god put things in order god placed things specifically out in the night sky because i'm going to share with you a couple thoughts about when God is laying and restructuring the universe, we're going to go take you to a unique place in the Bible where you see the details play out of, out of Genesis chapter 1. He lays out the cosmos. He put everything in order. And he even in his night sky placed the exact direction of where the third heaven is. It's out there. You want to hear something interesting? There's also another constellation out there that completely surrounds what we know today as the North Star, the Pole Star. Anybody know what the constellation is? That it wraps around that part of the night sky or the second heaven? Draco the dragon. 
You see the Bible coming true in Isaiah 14, huh? What did, I, what did Lucifer want in Isaiah 14? God's throne to get to the third heaven. And where's the third heaven? That's God's dwelling place. This is the place that Paul was at in 2 Corinthians 4. This is the place that Jesus ascended to in the Gospel of John when he comes out of the grave and the women realize who it was and they came and they were getting ready to hug him. And what does he say? Touch me not. Why? For I have not yet ascended to my father. And that evening he was letting Thomas put his hand and his fist in his side and everybody was touching him. The ascension. You want to hear an interesting thing about baptism? We talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. You know what we don't realize about the resurrection? That when Jesus genuinely and truly resurrected, guess where he went? Through the water. He went all the way up to that third heaven. So when we're bringing you out of the water, there's more to that baptism story than just the Pecos River coming out of the grave or this new life. We're talking about where you're going to be with him eternally. You have a thought? Right. And then the rebellion occurred, and that was the first flood because that earth started at the top and God plunged it down into the deep and ended the rebellion. Until he. That's, that's, uh, it says the earth standing out of the water and then in the water, Genesis 1 2, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So whatever existed under that first rebellion ended. Uh, whereby the world then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, which you have ends. in the first uh, eight verses, that firmament was separated again, and now you're, you're starting over. And so when he created Adam, that's why he said to replenish, not to plenish. To replenish. Replenish something that was already there. So that was the significance of the rainbow, because God had already destroyed the earth with water twice. Yeah. Right, right. Did everybody get the text? Just go back and read second. It's in my notes. So David already covered it. Thank you. Appreciate it. No, we're good. We're good. That's okay. So that said, that is a great passage. And he just laid it out beautifully because what you're getting is a New Testament view from Peter of exactly what we just read in Genesis. Uh, another, another just a little sidebar. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So it's all about that crystal sea and exactly how it's like. And I so speaking of which now go ahead and turn with me to an interesting passage in the Bible. And we'll talk about how God details for us this 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 very structure that we're reading about here in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. But turn with me to the book of Job, chapter 26. Let's just kind of start there and look at a couple verses. Job is an interesting book in your Bible. I don't know if you're, you know this about the book of Job, but it's also the oldest book in your Bible. And it's in the book of Job where you find the actual details of the things that happen in Genesis chapter 1. I mean, there are constellations in, that are mentioned here that are, that are mentioned nowhere else in the Bible. Um, if you can find Psalms, it's the book right before Psalms. Job chapter 27, let's look at a couple verses that speak of this restructuring, this recreation as God puts together this, this sea element, this, this crystal sea that ultimately he ends up removing. Look at verse number 7 of chapter 26. It says, And he stretcheth forth out the north over the empty, over the empty place and hangeth the earth. Listen to this verse upon nothing. Isn't that fascinating? 
right there, the Bible gave you the actual direction to the third heaven. What is it in that verse? It's north. The importance and the significance of north. So I don't know what you know about true north versus magnetic north or the compass or anything else. But if you want to find true north in the cosmos, and you guys know this from, from history and from studying, but the way they used to navigate before all the electronic systems that exist today were through what? When ships were coming from Europe into the New World, they used the stars to navigate. Did you know that your watch is set, is, is set by the cosmos? There's a huge telescope 50 miles south of London called Greenwich, England that sets everybody's watch to the stars. And true north is the North Star. It's also known as the Pole Star. If you guys were to, if we had an umbrella here tonight and we popped that umbrella open, that stem of the umbrella, if you're looking at it at the top of the umbrella, would be the Pole Star as it relates to God's universe. And everything revolves around the Pole Star. The Pole Star doesn't move. That's why it's called True North. It's static. It's stable. Just like Greenwich Mean Time, GMT, that zero degrees longitude is the official standard for what every clock and every watch is set by in all of, in, on the entire planet. So that becomes True North. And if you're not sure where True North is, just find the Little Dipper and it's the last star on the handle of Little Dipper. And if you're not sure where the Little Dipper is to the north, find the Big Dipper and the two end stars of the Big Dipper will always point to the Little Dipper. That's true north. That's the pole star. Probably. <laughs> so that said, think about Think about who surrounds the pole star. Draco the dragon. That constellation. Keep reading with me. Now look down to Job. Uh, keep reading verse number uh, 8. 27 verse 8. For what is the hope? I'm sorry, that's 26. Verse 8. He bindeth up the waters in thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. Did you know there's clouds in the cosmos? Did you know you can get a good telescope and see the clouds? We have a really good telescope up here on the upper room. Leroy, we're going to have to set it up sometime. Anybody know what that's called? No, not the Milky Way. It's called nebula. There are systems out there. These cloud systems made up of stars that are called cloud nebula. He bindeth up the waters in the thick clouds and the cloud is not rent under him. He holdeth back the face of the, his throne and he spreadeth forth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with, bound, with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. Look down at um, Job or flip over to Job chapter 38. Look at verses 7 through 11. When the morning stars sang together, anybody know who these morning stars are? These were angelic beings. This is eternity, eternity past. And the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with doors? When it break forth as it were and issued out of the womb. When I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling board for it. Isn't that interesting that God always likens his creation or his universe or the actual structure of the universe. You don't see it in this picture in the shape of a garment. Isn't it interesting that wherever you go on this planet everything's in the shape of a pyramid. Or the pyramids, any reason you, you suppose why the Mayas did what they did and the Egyptians did what they did? If you believe the, the Egyptians actually built the pyramids. Why those structures? Why in that structure? Watch this. Keep reading. This is really interesting. Verse 14. It turned. Where did I leave off? And he break it up for it might decreed place and set bars and doors and said hitherto shalt thou come but no further and there shall be 
thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning star of the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know thy place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth that the wicked might be shaken out of it. It is turned as clay to the seal and the stand as a garment. Hang on to that thought because I'm going to show you something really interesting in the Gospels here in a minute. Job chapters 38 verses go to 30 and 31 now. Just jump ahead a little bit to the other side of your page. For the waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep and this gets back to David Nebel's point is what? Is frozen. Now you can see why John saw what he saw. Look at verse Number 31, canst thou bind the sweet influences of, listen to these verses, or the, this verse, to the Pleiades, or loose the hands of what? Of Orion. Anybody know what those are? Or what that is? They're constellations. Isn't that the small dipper star? No, that's called the seven sisters. The Pleiades are seven sisters. Anybody, any Hawaiians in here besides Kalani? Kalani's not here, but. The Pleiades is worshipped by the Hawaiian people. That their star gods came from the Pleiades. Bible from prophecy and everything else. We're going to like it. There's going to be a fourth temple. We know that is the millennial temple. And you find that in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Revelation chapter 20 during the millennium. And then the last and final temple is what we just read about now. And that is God himself will be our tabernacle and we'll be with him forever. So there's no need for three heavens anymore. There's no need anymore for structures or buildings. Why? Because according to 21.3, he now is our tabernacle. He's ours. We're his. So just a chart here that would kind of help you see how these patterns and these models that you find in the Bible are nothing more than examples of these dwelling places and the dwelling place that God allows us to be a part of. So the last few verses, verses four through eight, let's look at how things play out in eternity future. This new setting is kind of how I How I worded it to maintain some of these alliterations. But look at verse 4. Love this verse. There will be, folks, in this new setting, in this new environment, this new heaven, this new earth, where God is now our tabernacle, there will be no more suffering. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are all passed away. Isn't that awesome? No more suffering and no more pain. Verse 5. All things new, physically, spiritually, and even emotionally, we're going to be made whole. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. That includes us. We're whole finally. No more pain, no more suffering because of verse 5. And uh, we're just going to ultimately be in a good place. And look at verse 6. I love these words, this little phrase that shows up in the verse, in the text. And he said unto me, and here it is, folks. It is what? He's done, man. He's completely done. It is done, he says. I am the Alpha, <clears throat> the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water freely. Everything that God set out to do from the very beginning on that timeline is now complete, is now done. And now we're back to experiencing him. And I love this word that's in here because you see it again in the book of Genesis. Freely. Just take of me freely. God says, verse 7, And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his 
God and he shall be my son. And there's that relationship thing again. And we've used this verse about overcoming several times in our faith study on Sunday mornings. 1 John 5, 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So we're overcomers because of the resurrection. We're overcomers because of who we are in Christ. And uh, again, he reminds us and brings into some closure the fact that we've overcome. So all pain, all suffering, all temptation has been overcome. And in verse 8, again, an interesting kind of a bizarre little verse kind of embedded in this, in the middle of this, what I call a very positive, very optimistic message. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murmurers, murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and liars and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire or in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, <clears throat> which is the second death. And you just do see this God calling out for a final time the wickedness that brought us to this very place and the need for restoration and redemption. So that's how it closes in these first eight verses. So what we're going to do next week um, is we're going to look at the rest of the chapter and share some really interesting and fascinating insight on this whole new Jerusalem thing. What is it about? What is it for? Who is it for? Um, all those questions and all those things are going to be answered. The very structure of the new Jerusalem is mentioned in the text. So... Um, just to kind of give you a hint or a heads up. Um, this is going to be your dwelling place in eternity. This new Jerusalem place. This new Jerusalem thing. And I'm going to show you some interesting images um, about how and where it's going to reside. Keeping in mind that God has removed that veil. We're back to one heaven. And we're looking at his glory lighting up the all of creation and the new Jerusalem just kind of hovering over Jer the physical, literal Jerusalem, planet Earth, as God begins to do some amazing things eternally, which we'll look at uh, next week, as well as in a couple interesting places in <clears throat> the Old Testament. Questions like, what will I be doing in eternity will be answered, hopefully. Um, anybody ever ask what it is that you're going to be doing? I think we're going to find out. That'll be a lot of it. That'll be a part of it. And um, But that'll be a major, major, major role. So... Um, so, Pastor, all this happens during the, the rapture, right? No. All this happens... All this happens at the very, very end. Here's, here's the rapture. And then right after the rapture, Phil, we're going to have these seven years. While all the stuff that we've been reading about ha is happening on planet Earth in those seven years, in this red box is where we're going to be. We will be in Revelation chapter 4. That's where that sea of glass showed up. So during those seven years... We're giving an account. We're giving an account of what we did with our life. What's lesson number 16 in discipleship? Anybody know? The lesson on the judgment seat of Christ. We want everybody to know and understand your responsibility in this life. Also over here, we're going to experience what is known as the marriage supper of the lamb. This is that wedding day that we talked about. When was it? Three or four weeks ago at the second coming of Christ. Uh, there's going to be a wedding and then we come back with him and then Jesus is going to rule on this earth from a throne, from a kingdom, from Jerusalem for how long? A thousand years. And after the thousand years, Phil, we're going to head into eternity. So everything that we're looking at is eternal stuff. So the ones that have gone before us? People... That have died before us, you mean? Um, go to First uh, Thessalonians chapter four. Let's answer that question. Good question. 
So Phil's question is, what about the people that went before us? So we're talking about believers, right? We're talking about people that died in this period right here. What we know is the church age. Looking at our little chart here, Phil, this period right here. These last 2,000 years since Jesus resurrected till the rapture of the church, we are living in a period known as the church age, the age of grace. The only way to come to God in the age of grace is how? The death, burial, and resurrection. Belief in your heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and thou shalt be saved. Right? For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of, your, not of, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. It's a gift of God. So anybody who accepts Jesus Christ in this period here. So let's say we had a really good friend, a really good buddy that died 20 years ago. My dad died in 2013. He was saved. Guess where he's at right now? His spirit, his soul is with Christ. How do we know that? Second Corinthians chapter five. To be absent from the body is to be what? Is to be present with the Lord. So his soul goes to heaven with Christ, the third heaven that we were talking about tonight. That veil is still there. Why is that veil still there? Because eternity hasn't happened yet. So he's with Jesus right now. But where's his body? Here on planet Earth. So this is a man that's already died. But guess what? When the rapture happens, he gets to go first. Let me show you where that's in the story. Second, Second Thessalonians 4. Did I say Second Thessalonians? First. First, first. Did I say first, first? Okay. I said first, first. Thanks, Ollie. Okay. Oh, okay. Look at verse number 13. And then whenever you find this phrase about not being ignorant, it's again the Holy Spirit putting that in our in the Word of God to remind us of some significant, some profound truths that He really wants us to pay attention to. There's some things that we ought not be oblivious and ignorant about as believers, and this is one of them. It's called the rapture. Look what He says. But what's cool about this passage versus other rapture verses or passages is this is how He lays out the order and the structure of how the rapture is going to actually happen. Look at what He says here in verse 13. But I would not. Have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep? What's the implication of those that are asleep? Somebody who's in bed? No. Somebody who has died. In this case, my father. Right? So here's what I want you to know, Paul says. Don't be ignorant about this thing, about these people that have died before us. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He says, you know what? You have no reason to, to stay mourning and be in mourning because... They're with Jesus. They're with him versus people that have no hope. People that have died without Christ. People that have never heard the gospel. People that never received Jesus. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there's the gospel again. How many of us believe that? How many have accepted this? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? So those folks that have died, God's going to bring him with them, although their soul is already with him. You know what hasn't caught up with them? Their, their new body. They're getting a glorified body. Look at the next verse. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, what this coming of the Lord, Phil, is this event right here, when he comes for the church. For his bride. The rapture. Look what he says. For we. For this we say unto you, by, unto you by the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord. Shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself. Shall descend from heaven with a shout. And the voice of the archangel. And with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall what? They will rise first. So. They go ahead of us. That trumpet sound, that rapture thing's going to happen. 
And those graves are going to open up. Those glorified bodies are going to come out of the grave. And look at the rest of the verse. Then, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them where? In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So where does that happen? In the clouds. And those people that died before us, they're ahead of us. We're going to meet them in the clouds. And guess what? We're going to make our way through this whole heavenly event thing. We're going to come back with him. As we saw a couple weeks ago at, at the second coming of Christ, we're going to reign with him for a thousand years out of Jerusalem. And as soon as this millennial thing is over and that judgment that we talked about last week is done, now we're in eternity. This is where we're at tonight. Make sense? From a chronological event standpoint. But what we have just been talking about is this event here. Look at, the, look at how the passage closes. I love this verse. Wherefore, he says, Paul says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Isn't that a comforting thing to know that he's coming back for us? He's coming back for you, Phil. So next week, Everybody take your Bibles. Um, speaking of Jesus coming back. He's coming back for who? The church. Give me another profound metaphor for the church in the context of the rapture. Do you have one, Kathy? The bride. You know what it's about? His bride. He's coming back for his bride. Remember we were talking about this um, a few weeks ago? The whole Jewish kind of wedding thing. The, you know what? When we talk about the Last Supper or when we celebrate the Last Supper, we're not really embracing the depth and the beauty of that event. When that, when that young Jewish boy was looking and asking for um, a young woman's or a young Jewish maiden's hand in marriage, he would go to the father and he would offer the cup of of being betrothed. In other words, if he would take it, if, if, and then he would pass it on to the, to the potential bride, to the, what would she be called before she's married or whatever? Yeah, fiance, I guess so. So he hands it to her. He hands it to her the, before they're even fiancés or whatever. And if she takes out that cup, then you know what she says? I'm betrothed to him. I'm going to accept him. And then you know what that young man does at that point? He goes back to his father's house, to his village, and to his dad's house to do what? To build a room. To build a place for him. This is why Jesus said what he said to the disciples in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, within the context of the Last Supper. He says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't freak out. I'm going to come back for you. But until I come, I'm going to go do what? I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Well, guess what that, that prepare a place for you is? It's the new Jerusalem thing. It's the, you know what he's doing right now? He's preparing that place. So when the wedding day happens, we're going to go back. And then he, he finally shows up. Once the house is ready, the father says, or tells the son, all right, go get your bride. He goes and he gets his bride and he brings her back with him. What an incredible, powerful picture of everything that we've been talking about in the last several months about, God, about God's plan and God's purpose. That last supper is profound, man. That whole taking of the cup is significant as it relates to the bride. This is what we lose sight of. This thing called the church is special and unique in God's plan and his purpose. So when Jesus says to the disciples in John chapter number 14, I love these words. You don't have to turn there. I'll go ahead and just read them to you. He says to them in verse uh, chapter 14, as he's about to talk about the Holy Spirit. By the way, he has the Holy Spirit as a picture in this chapter of being with us and being comforting with us. Well, guess who's checking back periodically to, to see how it's going with the bride. The Holy Spirit is the one reporting back and forth. And uh, the groom also has a messenger. Look what it says in verse 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. For if you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, look what he says, I will come again. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And whether I go ye know, and the way ye know. So there's the promise that he's going to prepare a place. And that place that he's going to prepare is what we're going to learn about next week. His new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. That's what he's preparing now. That's what's happening now as he prepares to come and get us. Does that make sense, Phil? The marriage supper of the Lamb actually plays out over here closer to his return. That whole return thing is about his kingdom. Jesus setting up his kingdom, the throne of David in Jerusalem. It's a Jewish kingdom, literal kingdom for a thousand years. And next week and in the next two weeks, we're also going to see about the significance and the role of planet Earth relative to the three groups of people. Why do you suppose all that stuff is out there? When I say stuff, planets, constellations, a lot of stuff out there, isn't it? Because this is going to kind of sit out there in eternity? I don't think so. Why? Because you see in places like Exodus and in 1 Kings Chapter Second Kings, Second Samuel, Chapter Seven, when God is pro promising this king that the expanse and His kingdom will expand, it'll grow forever. Isaiah, Chapter Number Seven. It's not just going to be on planet Earth. This place plays a unique place, but there's a reason why all that stuff is out there. That's eternity, and it's not going to be dark. There won't be any such thing as darkness anymore, and then we get to be a part. That's eternity. Does that make sense, Phil? So anybody who passes away ahead of us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, they're in his presence spiritually right now. Their soul is saved. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And they'll only be absent till the rapture. From the body. All right. Anybody else have. Uh, we have a few minutes for. A, maybe a question or two. If not we'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Are we good? Jack's got a question. The, like when the Lord is ruling for the millennium. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are the people that are here with him. Are they spiritual beings? Or are they. Great question. Blood, yeah. Or, you know, Jack's question. And what are the beings during the millennium going to be like? They will be flesh and blood. People will be having babies all the way even through the tribulation period into the millennium. So it'll be flesh and blood. The only spiritual beings will be us. Because we're coming back with him, reigning with him and ruling with him. So. There, yeah, here, Jack's great questions. What's the influence during this millennial reign? from satan he's going to be bound for a thousand years remember that from uh from that study however men men and nations will still be given a choice whether or not to go to jerusalem to worship and i think we kind of touched on that some people are going to refuse to and there will be consequences to that uh, but there will be absolutely there's going to be peace there's going to be harmony. There's going to be praise and worship going on in Jerusalem. Man, this, it's going to be a peace that this world has never seen during the millennium. It's going to be an incredible time. Literal, physical bodies that are going to be happening and playing out. That said, at the end of the millennium, Satan is loose one last time to deceive and to accuse and to do, to do what he does. And as a result... There's consequence to that, which ultimately leads to that event. So remember this little column here. How does how does somebody come to come to Christ in the church age? Faith in Jesus Christ in the tribulation. Endure the mark, endure to the end and refuse the mark in the millennium. 
It's going to be a Jewish thing. There's going to be sacrifices again at the temple. Those all kinds of Jewish stuff happening because it's a Jewish kingdom that's been restored. Ollie? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question is, will the people that will be rebel that will be rebelling and it doesn't really specifically or explicitly mention individuals, but more people groups or nations that will refuse to go and offer oblations to the Lord during the millennium. Um, what they're going to experience, and I, that's a great question, to be honest with you. I'm going to say, I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are, David, but I will tell you this. Their land will suffer the consequence of that rebellion. Through what? Zechariah 14, through doubt, through drought and disease. So, um, again, I love how God handles things all the way from the, from the beginning of time, man. From the very, very beginning on this timeline, from the days of Adam and Eve to the very end of the millennium to here. It's all about free will. You either choose or don't choose to worship God, to make him what he's called you to be and to do. And, and then there's consequence to that whole thing. So, all right, great discussion tonight. Again, next week, I'm going to remind you, we're going to be looking at the whole New Jerusalem thing and um, our dwelling place. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. What about your song? I'm sorry? Song. What song? Oh, yeah. You guys want to hear it real quick? Thanks. <laughs> thanks for, Phil, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, okay, I will. Hold on. Listen to this song. It's pretty cool. Cool song, huh? I thought you wanted me to sing, Phil. I'm going to turn this off.